difference between social media use and social, social media engagement. To stay connected to family and friends um, and loved ones, or just to gain news about what's happening in regards to protests and other things happening in the world. Um, those conversations, um, it was the platform itself was not necessarily built for that. What's up, y'all? Welcome to another video on Tea Time with Leticia. It's me, Leticia. In this video, I am drinking, let's see, can you see it all? It is ginger lemongrass tea. And this is uh, from Single Steeps. And you can get this tea from teaforte.com. But I was just super excited about this tea for two reasons. One, because they actually like send the loose leaf. So like I had to use a steeper and I'm trying to show you my steeper. I had to use a steeper in my tea. And so it's the authentic pieces and not just already pre-ground pieces that come in your regular tea packets. And one of my friends gave this to me as a care package for during the pandemic and during all of the things that are going on. So I really appreciate this tea from her. She's a member of the writing group that I'm a part of. And a fact about lemongrass tea is that it helps to soothe your stomach. So it aids in digestion and relaxes the nerves and reduces anxiety. So in today's video, I have a guest and I am now going to let him introduce himself. Hello, thank you so much, Leticia, for offering this space and time with you and taking time out of your day. I know it's your tea time, it's a relaxation time, so hopefully as I'm joining you today, um, I'm not going to intrude or impede, but actually add value to the space. <laughs> so I brought my tea as well. <laughs> um, um, I didn't really read and I just kind of know I pick up teas as I'm like at the store and I'm like intrigued by them. So this one is called Organic Cup of Sunshine. Um, it's like a kind of good mood. It produces a good mood. So it's one of those um, teas. It doesn't come in loose leaf in this particular um, box, um, but you do have to steep it for about 10 or 15 minutes to get the real effect. And it's got like a nice like floral um, um, taste and like kind of like tone to it, I guess that would be a word. Um, <laughs> and it's really, it does like happen to change the mood. It just like provides a little more lightened mood for me throughout my day as I'm drinking it. And it does, let's see about the caffeine. It's caffeine free. So that's always a good thing too. After I've had my morning coffee, I could still drink this. Oh yes, I love that it has sunshine in the name. Yeah. It <laughs> makes me want to smile. Mm -hmm. So in today's video, I'm going to have a conversation with Brandon concerning social media and um, our presence on social media as graduate students and his thoughts on how we currently use social media, how that impacts us now as graduate students, how our use on social media can future can impact our futures as graduate students, and just his knowledge and information and what his thoughts are on this topic. So first off, I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on the current use of social media for us as graduate students? Thank you for that question. So I want to start providing uh, by providing like a small disclaimer. So I didn't just like <laughs> um, engage with social media and then drop off the world and like have an opinion about it. Um, I actually, um, my background is in communication studies. So my bachelor's and my master's is, are both in communication studies. And um, dealing with social media has just been like my own personal preference. It wasn't like the necessarily the, um, I guess, the focus of the curriculum, but it, I had opportunities to take coursework and gain a little bit of knowledge, not necessarily expertise, but experience around like social media engagement, um, the use of technology and so on and so forth and um, marketing and all that. So yeah. Before you get to answering that question, what do you currently do? What are you studying right now? Yeah, I'm actually, I just finished my PhD in higher education. So Congratulations. How Thank you. How that translates is I've always kind of like taken a focus of looking at crisis communication, organizational communication. So looking at the higher ed institution as an organization and how they use their communication practices. So social media is just like a, um, a byproduct of that for me, how I understand it. Um, and right now in the given like the climate of what is taking place, um, this is actually something that I, again, have been studying for a while or just at least looking at and have been exposed to. Um, as we, um, let's see, I was an undergrad with, you know, Obama as president, and then that was kind of the nature of our conversations and how social media had evolved. 
throughout a space where we were allowed to voice and express our opinion and see change through social media platforms, right? Um, so we took that in each of our courses as like, you know, <laughs> a piece of uh, data that we would kind of extract. And we were, oftentimes we found ourselves inside of the comment sections, um, looking at just the current climate at that point in time of politics and the differing opinions and how people felt liberated to um, lead towards activism throughout social media platforms and such. So I really definitely became a little bit more, I would say, versed and exposed to um, social media and what uh, bad or harm it could do <laughs> to people's emotions and because of the way that we do, like I was stating in my post that you had read, um, the difference between social media use and social, social media engagement. So how we use social media, um, oftentimes we've been prompted to engage with it and like and socialize in a way that um, we do express our feelings freely. Uh, we are behind the computer. It's a different type of communication. So it's computer mediated communication, whether it be on the app or however you communicate. Um, but that oftentimes does not translate into certain conversations or spaces or contexts, um, especially right now in this context of healing for um, people of color, um, graduate students, those who are on, uh, because we are in a pandemic as well, on or using social media to stay connected to family and friends um, and loved ones, or just to gain news about what's happening in regards to protests and other things happening in the world. Um, those conversations, um, it was, the platform itself was not necessarily built for that. Um, and especially in uh, finding a way to heal through those conversations as trauma or um, you know, something like that is presented. I find it interesting that you say that the social media platforms were not built for, um, were not built for the type of uh, protesting engagements and things like that. Did I understand that correctly? Kind of, yeah, it, definitely. It just wasn't built for certain conversations, right? And protesting and, uh, or just the conversations that we're having about racism right now that are um, coming out as protests, right? And people have strong opinions about them. Um, those conversations are really polarized. Uh, people have a lot of different experiences with racism itself. Our identities are different because we're on this, um, and I'll be using Facebook as an example, but even Twitter, um, Instagram, and so on and so forth. There's a certain way that these algorithms were built for user control. Um, so it's really like Facebook in particular, we know, because if you've seen the movie, when, you know, that came out and all that good stuff that it was built off of like an academic system where people had their pictures on like their student ID cards and they were just rating people like hot or not.com, like looking at faces and saying, yes, this is a go and no, this is not. Um, so it's all about, um, gaining exposure and then expressing yourself and so on and so forth. However, there's no actual structure or algorithm that guides you towards, oh, how do you deal with um, depression? How do you deal with anxiety of people kind of rating you and so on and so forth? And then we've kind of like, just kind of kept going along with it and engaging with social media in a certain way that these user controls have adapted to that. It's never adapted to mental health, right? And that's kind of like something we're just like, wait a minute, Wait a minute. And there are other people um, that, you know, mental health professionals, in-person professionals, what's taking place right now that are really probably struggling or finding a way to use these spaces um, for mental health and having conversations and so on and so forth about that. However, all that you're exposed to and where it kind of stops at are these conversations, a polarizing conversation about what's, what's taking place because people are posting what they want to post commenting on what they want to comment on. And we're kind of going along with the algorithms and finding ourselves scrolling through, exposing ourselves to trauma and not being really intentional about our engagement. Wow, you really just opened my mind. <laughs> so I was aware of, you know, Facebook has an algorithm where they show you things based off of who you communicate with or who's in your messages or, you know, things that you've searched. But I never thought of the algorithm in the sense of, are they advertising to me mechanisms of healing? Mm -hmm. Are they showing me posts that are friendly or caring and loving versus they're just showing me what my friends post? Right. So right. the only way that I would get that kind of gentleness is if a friend decided to post that gentleness and not because the algorithm was like, you know what, let me throw in here something to brighten their day. <laughs> Which is funny because you can talk about it, like you mentioned, like maybe 
I don't know, I don't want to give any brand placement, but you can mention something in a conversation and they say, you know, you see it kind of pop up two days later or two hours later, you're like, wait a minute, who's listening, right? Um, <laughs> but it does a lot, to, uh, sorry, it has a lot to deal with um, what you click, like, and share, as I said in my post, um, and also in the com community that you have in other spaces. So for instance, um, I also noted in the post, like you can kind of think about the top 10 people that you interact with on the daily, that you text, that you call, that you FaceTime. And a lot of these apps are connected, you know? So like when you do open, for instance, Instagram and you have the stories that are there, it typically will show you the stories of individuals who you interact with most. They, those will populate into your algorithms um, first and you will see those pop up. Um, and then you have options as far as user controls to do what you want with that information. You can share it to your story. You can share it to your wall. Um, you can save it. <laughs> we have the screenshot. You can reply to it. You can like it. You can show a reaction. So it's really interesting, but it doesn't ever prompt you towards that. Um, so one, I guess, strategy that I had provided in my post was that we could, you know, instead change the algorithms a little bit and trick them. And in your search bar on these different platforms, you can search hashtags like racial battle fatigue, racial healing, mental health, and so on and so forth. And that will kind of, you look two hours later, maybe two days later, and you'll start to see those advertisements um, and those things into your feed. <laughs> that is so interesting. And I had never thought about that. Especially in the Black community, when you have it as sectors as graduate students, <laughs> I was trying to bring into this conversation definitely that. Like, we're kind of in a space, I know for myself, where we're using technology throughout this time, throughout this pandemic to stay connected. Um, a lot of us are in school and we're kind of finishing our programs and we're not with our family members. So staying connected on social media is a really good avenue um, for that. And then also some of the work that we do requires that we are now in this virtual space. So we're using technology outside of social media, but like our phones and such that are connected as we're doing our Zoom meetings to our computers and our other devices. And it's also being very intentional about the um, energy and the time that we're using within that space for ourselves, the, the energy that we're putting into that space as well. So thinking about, okay, am I thinking about my mental health when I am um, doing my work? It, because this space now that I'm virtually using to do work or work from home or even in this social media platform that I'm using to stay connected to my family, how am I using it? What energy am I putting into this space? Or am I just going back to what we have been socialized to do with social media and technology and just use it? Am I using it for my benefit or to just get the work done? Mm -hmm. So that makes me a uh, question. So there are some people who get onto social medias and they just vent, right? Um, and for some people just venting, that is a means of their expressing their feelings and you know healing. Would you suggest that that's not something that should be done considering what you just explained to us is that Facebook is not a space meant for handling those types of things? Unless you trick the algorithm, as you said. Before. Right. <laughs> so that last part is that caveat, right? But I think that um, first, I don't want to like, um, you know, have commentary on anybody's healing process because that I would not like for anybody to do that to my healing process and have commentary because it's my individual healing process. So how you engage with social media or technology and if it's a part of your healing process, um, I would just provide not even advice, but my own experience in that, you know, I would not want to provide anybody <laughs> or uh, judge anyone's experience in their healing. Um, as far as <laughs> is it a place to vent? Um, I just want to bring up like how I did put this post um, for this conversation. I kind of had my notes and my thoughts. I presented them on Facebook, but I actually used the user controls because I'm very intentional about that. Um, and I only made it visible to you because it was just kind of like, I needed to put all this out there. And then kind of like, as I was taking notes and from my kind of like grappling my notes together, I'm sorry, consolidating my notes together and grappling with these concepts, I was like, I need a space for that to be done. And Facebook is a space for that, you know? So you can make it public, private and so on and so forth. I only shared it with you. So in other instances, I would not have shared that publicly because it was just like my raw emotions, my thoughts, these were notes. Um, I'm very intentional about my certain platforms that I'm on of what I will post and the conversations that I will allow. Again, because this was a part of my training and my experience throughout um, school and undergrad, which was like 
um, led into my master's program was a big part of my life. I'm desensitized to it and, it, and I engage differently. I don't scroll through. I, I haven't in so many years. I know that I don't go on and scroll. Um, if you don't tag me in something and then like the day that I go and look at the notifications and if it's not there, I probably won't ever see it because I go on social media with the emphasis of like, okay, my sister just tagged me in something. I'm going to look at that because I don't get the notifications till later. Um, and then and or like if somebody has directed me to go there <laughs> or if in this instance, I'm like, oh, I have something to say and I want to post it. I will post it and I'll leave the site. I'm not there scrolling through other people's stories and stuff because for me that that clouds my space and that's not how I use or engage with social media, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I would, for my own experience or speaking from my own experience, say no, um, because even if we trick the algorithms, we're not there yet. And other people, it's kind of like when you're on the road and you're driving, that's how social media is. Everybody has their own user control so they could do what they would like. And if you're trying to, you know, make your, safe, um, your space safe, then you kind of want to protect that. Um, and by putting your raw emotions um, for anyone to criticize, be critical of, having emotion or um, expression towards on that space um, is not, I would not see it as healthy um, because it's kind of like a rabbit hole. People can, they are going to have their opinions and you may not like everyone's opinion. Mm. Yeah, that. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate how throughout this entire conversation, you really emphasize the importance of being intentional about, um, or how you choose to be very intentional about what you say, and what you post. And then I also really liked uh, in that last portion of what you were saying, how you really outlined the different questions that you should ask yourself. Like, are you ready for whatever commentary that may come your way based on what you post and things like that? I think both of those are very important things to make note of in this now very virtual world that we're living in. Are there any other tips or um, tricks to the algorithm or information you'd like to share? Yeah, so um, I was talking with a colleague about this um, and <laughs> I wanted to like air caution on the um, side of error and saying, or just let people know that like this is not the solution <laughs> like being intentional about how you engage with you know your computer media communication is not the the answer I don't have the answer but definitely just know that however you're healing is valid so if you choose to use your user controls by blocking individuals <laughs> that's okay muting individuals these are using controls that were presented to us and they're offered and they're there for a reason so use them um if you don't want to be on the space at all that is totally fine right if you're choosing to try to stay connected because throughout this pandemic that is again probably one of the best ways to do so um being really really intentional about um, not just what you're clicking and what you're sharing and what you're liking and who you're interacting with as far as blocking, but the time and energy, again, that you're putting into these spaces. So it's like, how much is enough time or how much is too much, right? How much becomes overwhelming when I'm searching? So even when you're searching for racial trauma and racial healing, you might gain some <laughs> history that presents trauma, right, um, in your search. And you want to just be careful about that. So I would say that um, just limiting ourselves to the exposure of trauma, finding ways to heal even outside of our technology use would be um, uh, just productive in our healing at this moment. Sharing your thoughts and your knowledge on interacting with social medias and the algorithms. And I just learned so much. <laughs> Thank so. you. Oh, yes. Just thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and information and contributing to Tea Time with Letitia. Thank you so much, for Letitia, um, for providing this space. I don't think that you know what this really means for graduate students to have this type of agency in this time to use, again, technology. These, um, I would say, majority dominant technological um, <laughs> tactics because this is typically um, to be an influencer, to have this platform, to um, situate ourselves in this space, typically um, is not the space for minorities. And you're providing that space for this, um, for graduate students, for graduate students of color, and conversations that, you know, are really passionate, we are passionate about and really close to us. So thank you for that.